Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Meet the Professor. As today we talk about the management of chronic lymphocytic leukemia with Dr. Nicole Lamana, uh, who is uh, with the uh, New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center in New York City. We also have several other investigators who took a survey of their usual treatment practices. And as we go through this program, we'll show you the results of that survey, but I think maybe it might be changed. We're gonna have to repeat this before we do another one after the ASH meeting, because uh, as it turns out, by great luck, the abstracts for ASH came out this morning and there's some pretty interesting stuff in there. One thing in particular that we're gonna to get to, I'll just mention uh, re probably relevant to that, that we will be talking about the use of non-FDA approved agents and regimens so check out package inserts for rapidly changing uh, uh, things happening in oncology. Today, we're really going to make rounds with Dr. Lamana. We have five general medical oncologists and community-based practice, and uh, we have eight uh, cases uh, from them that we'll be briefly talking about and really using those as a lever to get into some of the key data sets. Here are some of the, uh, uh, the cases that we're going to be talking about. We're going to just jump right in with a 67-year-old man. This is a patient of Dr. Bottinger, um, and you'll hear ab about this case as well as her questions. This gentleman is 67 years old. He was interesting in the sense that he had COVID-19 three times before he came to medical attention to see me in August of 22. And he was referred for lymphocyte predominant leukocytosis. I was in the middle of my diagnostic evaluation, but before I could talk to him about the results, he basically had an MI. And so he sort of tabled the CLL diagnosis to have a six-vessel cabbage <laughs> about a month after I saw him. But ultimately, his flow did show CLL and then develops worsening cervical adenopathy, difficulty swallowing, and a change in phonation. His voice had actually changed a little bit. So he has another CT scan in May of this year, which shows a marked progression of adenopathy, which you can see on this scan in the neck, although the image here is in, of the abdomen and pelvis. And he was also noted to have an enlarged spleen as well. So the time had come to discuss what we should offer him in the frontline setting. And so I would like to know your current shared decision-making approach when it comes to talking to your patients about BTK inhibitor therapy versus frontline obinutuzumab and venetoclax. And my second question is, what is your current practice when deciding on which BTK inhibitor to use? What's happened since you got the calibrutinum? He looks great. Actually, he's only been on it for, you know, a little less than four months. And I mean, honestly, our visits are very boring. His lymph nodes completely resolved and his voice went back to being normal and his blood counts look a lot better. So I'm sure you've heard this kind of story many times. I am curious uh, how the uh, recent uh, MI and cabbage might potentially affect a decision like this. Curious that he had COVID three times. I saw you did a lot of work uh, during the pandemic on COVID and CLL. Curious uh, what your thoughts are about that and how you would have looked at this before today or maybe before ASH or maybe before there's approval of uh, what we're gonna talk about, but let's just talk about how you would have looked at it previously. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the the um, uh, the caveat here we talk, all, of course, about is the coronary artery disease and the recent six vessel cabbage and is he on, you know, an antiplatelet agent, anticoagulation, you know, what is he on? And so if he's on an antiplatelet agent because he had a six vessel cabbage, you know, you do have to, if you're going to talk about a BTK inhibitor, we would certainly approach him about um, using a second generation given that you know, they have less cardiac issues. Um, you still have to tell them that these all can have increased bleeding and bruising. So if he is on, you know, an, an antiplatelet agent that you have to still counsel them about the increased risk. Uh, alternatively, and it just depends on, and I don't know how beaten up he was, you could have offered him, let's say, venetoclaxobinutuzumab as well if you were nervous um, about using a BTK inhibitor uh, in this scenario. And I think the best thing to do is, you know, you also talk to the cardiologist and you really just want to find out how brittle he is, uh, you know, that if he were to develop atrial fibrillation or have an issue, you know, how, you know, how bad 
uh, is his cardiac status. You know, I would probably want to make sure his echo is okay. Things like that is ejection fraction, even though coronary artery disease is different than, you know, a, 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 a regular arrhythmia issue, you know, you still want to kind of have a, a sense of how he is in case he does develop a complication, even if it's a second generation VTK inhibitor. Um, and I think it's fair to, to broach that, of course, when you have that full discussion with the patient and, and see which, uh, you know, which side they lean on. Um, then OB is a little bit more tricky, of course, because you also have to go through, you know, the, the, the ramp up and the maintenance and, and, uh, a little bit of, you know, that requires more monitoring. So the first two to three months of that combination is more labor intensive, um, but it is a time limited therapy too. So, so I think it's fair to, um, from a, from a purely CLL standpoint, he's trisomy 12. I don't know if he's mutated or unmutated. Oh, he's mutated. So he could have, you know, from a CLL prognostic marker, he could get either regimen, um, you know, be based on his disease factors. Um, there isn't one I, uh, you know, would prefer over another. Then it, it's really talking about the toxicity issues. Choice of BTK? I would do a second generation. Um, so uh, again, the, you know, either a Cala or Xano, I think are fine. If you're worried, let's just say, he has uh, poorly controlled or difficult to control hypertension, maybe you lead a little bit to a cala. Otherwise, I think Xanu is fine. The cardiac issues with both are very small. Um, both of the head to head studies really show a decrease of, you know, HFib, but also cardiac events in general and thus discontinuations due to cardiac events. And that includes Xanabrutinib too. So, um, so I actually have no problem with either drug in this scenario. So again, uh, this patient had COVID, you know, diagnosed actually yeah. 2022 initially, yeah. had, had it three times. Any thoughts you re reflecting back on your work and others of uh, COVID during the pandemic and now? Yeah, yeah obviously, thankfully, very different uh, from 2020 to 20. 21, 22. It was really, you know, for CLL and COVID was one of the deadliest things that I have encountered uh, since doing this. And I've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, the, the, you know, more, the highest mortality was in cancer was in CLL patients. Um, so it was uh, really grim in the early years. Now it is very different. Now it really is uh, much like the, when I see the flu or any uh, viral complications in CLL patients, including in COVID, it really is more akin to what we dealt with previously, that patients can get COVID or flu, may get sick. Um, the, the most important things that really tend to happen are what we call post-viral complications, where they get run down due to whatever virus they get. And then I'm worried that they get a superimposed bacterial pneumonia. That's what we dealt with before COVID in 2020. That's what we're kind of dealing with now. So now the last year or so, you know, when patients get sick, they're not running to the hospital and getting admitted. We'll always get one or two every year that will come in with one of these post-viral complications, but that certainly is much more acceptable in this area error of COVID compared to 2020, but not uncommon in our CLL patients to get COVID often and variability on severity, but much, much better compared to 2021 and 2020, you know, so I'll take it. Yeah. And actually, um, you know, in this uh, abstract or this uh, phase three trial, we're about to talk about it. Look, a lot of these deaths were from COVID. It looks like half of them are the deaths that occur. Anyhow, here's uh, what uh, I got all excited about. Well, uh, we initially talked about last time we did this uh, program with Matt Davids, so we were talking the just the press releases that I was trying to squeeze out of him details, but he wouldn't talk. So I think his partner, uh, our colleague uh, Jennifer Brown, is probably going to present this. But here it is this morning, and not embargoed. You know, it's interesting uh, what they choose to put in the plenary session because actually there's some kind of cool things, but I don't think it affects anywhere near as many patients as this abstract is. Keto, so the plenary got, I thought it was interesting, ketogenic diet enhances CAR-T anti-tumor function. That's kind of cool. And efficacy and safety of oral BTK inhibitor Rilzambrutamib in ITP is a couple of the uh, uh, interesting uh, plenaries. But to me, this is the one that's going to affect a lot of people, and we're very looking forward to it. Let's talk a little bit about the design of this time-limited limited trial, uh, looking at uh, Ven, uh, Acala, and plus or minus Avena, Abeno versus uh, chemo, FCR, BR. 
Yeah. So this, I mean, obviously this is a very exciting trial because in the U S we're all looking forward to seeing sort of these oral, oral combinations with a calibrutinib or xanabrutinib with the newer uh, second generation BTK inhibitors. Now this did, as Neil suggested, this also, you know, did enroll because it's being presented now, obviously during COVID. So, so you can imagine that did, that was an implication, but it was to, you know, um, younger, fitter patients. They didn't, they were not allowed to have 17 P deleted because they were randomized to either a Calavan or a Calavan OB or investigator choice of chemoimmunotherapy. And so remember, because we don't think chemoimmunotherapy is a suitable choice for most patients, but certainly not for patients with deletion 17P or P53, you could not have that going on to the study. So that was the three-arm randomization. Um, as you can see, it's a very large study, um, over 800 patients, so two, almost 300 in each arm. The medium follow-up now is 41 months, so that's really pretty good. And you can see here that there was, again, maybe not surprising from some of the other randomized data that we have, um, the AV and AVO arms were superior compared to the chemoimmunotherapy arms with either FCR or BR. So there's no doubt that the median PFS has not been reached in the um, targeted therapy arms um, versus 48 months in the FCR BR arms. So really good. And even the AV demonstrated a little bit of an overall survival benefit already uh, compared to chemoimmunotherapy. So um, there's no doubt that this met its endpoint uh, with the superiority of targeted therapy over chemoimmunotherapy. And again, for many of us, um, th the question is, we hope that something, because this is a randomized study, might lead to the first oral oral approval here in the U.S. Um, of an oral oral, a BTK, BCL2 combination. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. And, uh, you know, it's going to make these choices like this first case, you know, uh, a, a little lot more different. interesting as... <laughs> Right. And, you know, I guess another thing is, I mean, it didn't, you know, randomize against, for example, Ven Obin, but when you look at the hazard rates here and sort of indirectly compare it, does it sort of line up to what you would expect? I, I don't know if they're going to present patient reported outcomes, but I would guess, you know, if you're getting a, a month or two of a Cala rather than a bin, that those patients are going to be a lot happier and their doctors. Any thoughts about uh, that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, this is definitely if the, you know, if we get an oral oral approval here with Akala and Ven, I think this will definitely eat into the Ven OB uh, you know, pie, uh, so to speak, that, you know, patients who are gonna want a time limited approach are gonna say, Hey, if this data looks just as good or maybe perhaps even better with longer follow-up, then I don't need to get something that's intravenous and have the hassle of sitting in the chair for hours, monitoring for tumor lysis, so on and so forth. And so I think that there's no doubt that I think that this will um, diminish the use of NOB for sure and possibly even BTK monotherapy, you know, chronic continuous therapy for folks who, who also want to take an oral drug but get off of it. So I think that there will be um, uh, you know, I think this will be a game changer for a lot of patients here in the United States. And certainly, you know, anytime this happens where an abstract comes out, we haven't seen any presentation. We need to see the presentation. We need to hear people talking about it. We just wanted to give you a little preview about what to expect. And uh, I think we sort of dealt a little bit with some of the things that people might be saying. Also, I was curious, you know, at the last uh, EHA meeting, they presented Zen and Venetoclax, uh, and this was with people with Del 17P, uh, TP53. Anything you want to say about that? And also, they now have a phase three trial uh, looking at Zen combined with Son Rotoclax, another BCL2 inhibitor. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think what's nice about the this this first, uh, let's talk about the Sequoia RMD. I think what's very nice about this RMD is it's probably going to be the largest, it is right now, the largest study that has a, a, a large cohort of patients with 17P or TP53. And so that's really important because, you know, we always have this going, you know, we always have this discussion among CLL experts about you know, can you offer a time limited approach to somebody who has high risk features? And most of us still prefer chronic continuous BTK inhibitor based therapy. However, if the oral oral combination looks good and is better than, you know, when we look at the data from venetoclaxobinutuzumab from CLL14, the PFS for patients with deletion 17P or P53 drops off. And so that's why most of us still favor chronic continuous therapy. But 
if this, um, you know, this large cohort of patients, you know, with Xanu and Ven look like the PFS is pretty good in a high risk patient population, then many of us might be, you know, might be more willing to give a time limited approach. So that's Sequoia RMD, large arm of high risk patients. Now, what they have also is a Sunrotoclax is a next generation, very potent BCL2 inhibitor. And so they, they started working with this and, and have combined it with their drugs and it obviously is Xanabrutinib. And so there is um, a combination of obviously the oral oral. And this trial also, you know, they have a trial that randomizes this to Venobi. Um, and so, um, so this is a, obviously something that we're all eagerly watching as well um, as whether or not this is going to be um, similar to Acala and Xanu. Is this a better BCL2 inhibitor than Venetoclax? I think that, you know, we don't know. That remains to be seen. Is it more potent or not? Uh, will it mitigate TLS? Although one would argue if you're going to combine it with a BTK inhibitor, it won't matter because you'll downgrade their tumor lysis by, you know, front loading them with a BTK regardless. Um, so I think uh, we're all excited to see more data from the Xanu stone rotoclax. So another question I'm curious about is, uh, and you know, we've been pleased, you know, when you use anti-CD20, for example, of benetuzumab prior to venetoclax, it helps debulk the patient, lowers the risk of TLS. How effective are BTK inhibitors in debulking in that, you know, from the same purpose? Oh, absolutely. So I think that any of these oral oral combinations, you're going to front load the BTK inhibitor and that will make it really easy uh, for debulking, right? So, you know, because the lymph nodes decrease quite dramatically very quickly. Um, and then you could do that either in a two month, you know, different protocols have done it differently, either a one month, two month or three month lead up, and then you could start the BCL2 inhibitor. Um, and that makes it very easy then to do this all as an outpatient, uh, because most patients, the majority of patients are downgraded if they have high risk disease. And so it makes it much easier to do an oral oral combination with front loading the BTK. So it's, it's a, it'll be much easier than let's say, you know, even Venobi for, for, for sure. So again, it's going to be interesting to go back to the faculty and ask them what they think uh, after ASH. A lot of times we say to people, put aside reimbursement and FDA approvals, just what would you really like to give? And actually, we saw people talking about giving BTK and VEN, like, for example, for unmutated disease. A lot of people who did the research, they were saying like two years ago they wanted to do this. But now I think maybe it's going to be a lot easier in terms of accessing so also we get into the issue we kind of alluded before the sort of Coke Pepsi thing of Xanu and Acala. We were just kind of curious uh, how people thought sort of off the cuff, you know, even putting aside evidence based, just generally speaking, uh, for uh, what they prefer. And you can see some people that prefer Acala, some prefer Z uh, Xanu, and others like you say kind of a coin flip. But also we kind of pull it down a little bit more and say how you see, again, globally, efficacy and tolerability. You do see, uh, at least uh, Matt bringing up the issue of Xanu maybe being more efficacious, but also in terms of tolerability, it's uh, interesting uh, uh, that some people prefer a Cal or think that's a little easier other Xanu, and you say, depends on the profile. What do you mean? Well, you know, I mean, so, I mean, efficacy, why I think Matt brought it up just because Xanu has the only data, you know, two BTKs that really did show a difference between a Brutinib and Xanu. Now, you know, we can go back and forth about there'll never be a head to head with Xanu and Acala. So just forget that, nor should there be um, to waste patients and money and time on that kind of a study. Toxicity profiles are a little bit different. You know, obviously we, t you know, we counsel patients if they're going to go on Acala that they might have uh, front, you know, they might have more headaches in the beginning. And that's really more unique to Acala than the other BTKs. Xanu, there's definitely a little bit more myelosuppression that I observe with Xanu. So you can have more neutropenia, a little bit more anemia and thrombocytopenia. And so I think you just need to keep an eye on that as well. Um, I, you know, the bleeding issues to me seem pretty equal across the board. I, I really don't see a difference. Um, when we talk about hypertension, right? So some of the studies, the head-to-head -head data with a brutinib and uh, a Cala obviously showed less hypertension with a Cala with a brutinib and Xanu showed the, about the same degree of hypertension in that study. And so if you have, you know, uh, you know, if really somebody who's poorly controlled, you might prefer a Cala in that sense, uh, you know, versus Xanu, but there's also a difference in, um, drug dosing, right? So, you know, Xanu, you can give once a day rather than twice a day. Um, and it has more dosing. So you could, you know, also reduce the dosing more easily if you want to, because you're concerned about a toxicity. Acala is really a twice a day drug. So you just have to keep that in mind too. So some people may have a preference based on once a day or twice a day dosing. And there's only so many, you really can't 
you can only either dose reduce to once a day with a Cala. Um, and the question about that then with PK and stuff is a little different because it really is, it, it, the PK is really a twice a day dosing. Um, so there are things to think about that way, whether that meaningfully contributes to long-term outcomes. I'm not sure we're going to get that kind of, you know, we're going to be, uh, get that kind of data in the future, but you know, they're just, you know, little subtle differences between the two. Overall, they're both really great drugs. So we're being really picky when you hear me say about all these little differences. Just going on to another case, uh, this is from uh, Dr. Erica Rupard, a uh, 74-year-old woman, IGVH unmutated DEL13Q. He has a very interesting clinical question for you. Here's Dr. Rupard. I'm curious for your faculty members, Neil, do you ever treat patients who are rye stage zero, no fevers, chills, night sweats, weight loss, no cytopenias, but have fatigue because this patient who is in spite of her 74 years old is a bus driver for one of the local school districts and really enjoys that job but she drives the kids to school in the morning she says she goes home now and takes a nap and then drives them home in the afternoon and that didn't used to be the case also curious of course what your regimen of choice is for a 74 year old with a new diagnosis this is somebody who's not very elderly and also, of course, not very young. Do you prefer an oral therapy like a BTK inhibitor, or do you prefer the venetoclaxabinituzumab in terms of responses, tolerance, and so forth? So if I treated her, it would be to try to eliminate the fatigue. It is bothering her. It's affecting what she does during the day. So that might be an indication. And I'll probably lean towards giving her a trial at treatment and seeing if, you know, after a couple of months of a BTKI, if she's feeling better. And if she is, then it may be worth it for her. Any thoughts? Yeah. So uh, on par, I'm going to say that generally speaking, we really don't try, you know, we try not to treat people just on the basis of fatigue uh, alone, although obviously this presents a really interesting case in the sense that it does occur. So the question is how, do, you know, she, he said he, she was an early stage, really didn't have any other indications for treatment except fatigue. So this is the kind of, you know, when I have these cases and they don't happen very often, but when I do, I, you know, I'm always thinking about, okay, so is the fatigue due to the disease? And if it is, am I committing her? So I actually tried to avoid um, long-term therapy on this person because I don't want to commit her to long-term therapy if she doesn't have a real indication for treatment, cytopenias or bulky nodes. So I'm thinking short-term time-limited treatment usually for those. And also it serves as a trial because if, if, um, if her fatigue doesn't get better really with treatment and, and it's time-limited, you get them off of treatment. You don't commit them to a chronic continuous BTK inhibitor. The other thing I've done in the past, and again, this goes back to an older error since I'm old, is believe it or not, these are the kind of patients, if they had no other indication, I actually would start with a monoclonal antibody. So let's say you were doing a time-limited approach. Um, you know, And back in the day, this was Retux, if you were worried if she's frail and you didn't want to commit her because you're not sure her fatigue is really due to the CLL. So you could do Retux. You could do Obina. But the point is, is if her fatigue really does get better, then you go, okay, then I'm going to add the oral agent and I'm going to do a time-limited therapy and be done with it. Now, now you're asking, Neil, well, now if we get approval for an oral oral, you could do the same thing in that fashion as well. So I guess the, the answer I'm trying to say here is I wouldn't commit her to chronic continuous therapy um, to put somebody through that because of the potential, you know, uh, long-term toxicities that people have being on chronic continuous therapies, particularly if she may not need it and it's just treating fatigue. My experience with those individuals is if it's really due to the disease, they actually get better very quickly and you don't have to commit them to long-term therapy. Um, so a time-limited approach would be something I would favor in a patient that you're not so sure that you really you know, she has a real indication for treatment, but want to help her. And so that's one way to do that. That's what I would do. You say you were old. <laughs> I've been doing please, CL please, oh, CLL please, a long please. time. <laughs> I don't think so. So uh, <laughs> 20 yeah, years of amusing. CLL though. Oh yeah. 20 <laughs> years. So uh, we got a question. I, actually a quick case uh, from the chat room from uh, Priya, Priya Rudolph, who works with us a lot. She says she has a patient with a small retinal bleed on a cala, but has well-controlled CLL, also in clopidogrel for coronary artery disease. What would you do? Yeah, so, um, you know, there are some patients that I think 
Um, so one is, is, uh, you know, there's a couple things to, to think about. So one is speaking to the specialist and, uh, and is this a significant retinal bleed that we need to discontinue therapy? Not, I don't think that happens. You don't necessarily have to do that for all patients. Um, two is also how long have they been on therapy? And, and if you decided to, if they've been on it a long time and had a very good response and she had let, uh, another recurrent or it's a bleed, that's not um, uh, you know, uh, you know, resolving or reabsorbing when you speak to the optometrist, you know, then the question is, do you need to take them off or recurrent bleeds? I probably would. Um, I haven't taken everybody off. There are some of my patients that I think still had better, but you also have to factor in that the patient's on an antiplatelet agent. So I think there's a couple, I would just dig a little deeper. If they've been on long-term therapy, there's a consideration for a break or changing. If they were a patient who had high-risk disease, you may not, you then you may decide you may not want to do that if they have a 17P or P53, or if they have recurrent bleeds, you might want to switch their therapy to VEN. Um, so I think that you don't have to stop everybody's um, BTK for a bleed, depending upon how significant the bleed was. And I think you need to talk to the eye doctor, get a sense of, of whether or not they're concerned. So yeah, the, uh, Priya says the ophthalmologist uh, advised to stay on it. So she left. So I think it's it. fine. Yep. So, uh, Speaking of high risk, uh, we also asked the faculty what they what they're thinking now. Again, after Ash, I'm not sure what people are going to be thinking. You might want to speculate on that. But pre uh, amplify, Dell 17P T53 or not. So without it, I guess people use their usual approach, and you bring up all the options, which I think is also I think everybody else would probably agree with that. But then when you get over to uh, Dell 17P T53, everybody said BTK little bit of preference one way or the other. Uh, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so that's what we were talking about. I think that for most of us, if they don't have high-risk disease, you know, and they're fit, it just depends. I think people are seeing if this is a fit 70-year-old, do they want to do Ven OB or not? You could still do time limited. Um, keep in mind, though, even the patients who are unmutated with time limited, their PFS does drop off, but they still can buy many years off of treatment. And so I don't think we, you know, will completely exclude the unmutateds from Ven OB. The, the, the patients with high-risk disease, that's what we were talking about, is most of us favor continuing patients on a chronic uh, BTK inhibitor. Now with this data with Amplify, um, and uh, or more importantly, are, actually Amplify, sorry, take that back, because Amplify didn't include 17P, but the like the Sequoia RMD, the question was, is, you know, in patients with 17P or P53, can you give them an oral oral? How long is their PFS or their time to next treatment if they're on an oral oral? And could we offer that to patients with high-risk disease? So I think that'll be a, a, a trial and an arm to watch. Otherwise, most of us still tend to give, um, you know, chronic oral continuous therapy for those patients with 17P or P53. So this is a question we started asking in the old days, and uh, I think when people thought about time limited, they immediately thought about, you know, a benetuzumab and benetuzumab toxicity, looking for TLS. It's going to take a while to think about time limited BTK and uh, venetic lax, a pretty uh, different story. But anyhow, in the pre-amplify or pre-combination uh, days, oh, yeah. uh, the question comes up, uh, what fraction of patients would rather uh, receive time-limited uh, therapy? And maybe yeah. we kind of flip the numbers here well, a little bit. Mess but that up. Has, yeah, that's, I think it was just a question. I think a bunch of people flipped it one the other way. We but mess that I think up. In, yeah. In, in any event, I think in general, there's been this feeling that younger people pr prefer, uh, more likely prefer time-limited yes. therapy. That's o true. Older people are getting 18 medications, although I just doubt that you are. Uh, but and that, again, that might change. But I am curious, at least up to now, do you think that older people really would prefer continuous therapy? BTK? No, I think I think uh, if it was, uh, I think the oral oral combination, if we, you know, given how that is easy to do, um, easier to do, I think that if if broached in that fashion, many older patients probably be like, oh, yeah, you can tell me I was going to start this drug. It's a BTK inhibitor similar to what you would do anyway, and then later on add another oral drug, and then I can stop them all in a year or so. I think that many older patients would be okay doing that too. I think when they hear about Venobi and we tell them about all they need to do, they're just like, eh, that sounds like way too much work, doc. And you're going to tell me I need to come to the hospital th that often and maybe even be hospitalized. 
they're not into that. You know, our younger ones are more committed because they want to get off a drug and just move on with their lives. Maybe they they have kids and this, that, and the other thing. And so some of them are more willing to commit to, to all that front loaded work. And so, um, although it turns them off too, but I do think an oral, oral combination will probably change this for uh, both younger and older and more people will probably choose that versus chronic continuous. Although I do think there's still a few select patients who might be like, start me on a pill. I'm fine with that. So speaking of older, we actually have a, I was doing a, putting together some cases for this Aon meeting today, and we had a 97-year-old woman who got uh, immunotherapy and had a great response and doing phenomenal, so opening up the avenue even into the 90s. But here's a patient of uh, Dr. Uh, Shams Buffalino, who's 85. Here's the case and her question. 85-year-old female. She was diagnosed with CLL by peripheral blood flow testing in 2020 when she was found to have an absolute lymphocytosis. She did well for the last couple of years until more recently when she developed progressive fatigue, a 10-pound weight loss, and also a rapid rise in her white count with a lymphocyte doubling time of less than six months and also a new onset thrombocytopenia with her platelet count right around 100. I elected to start her on acalabrutinib just recently. I guess my sort of topic of discussion here was sort of what people were doing in practice for elderly patients with CLL. And if Brun kinase inhibitors were chosen, what typically were people choosing or not choosing to do for prophylactic therapy for infections, specifically for viral or fungal infections or PJP? I think we talked a little bit about the age thing, but I think this question about prophylaxis, uh, you look in the package insert, it doesn't exactly tell you exactly what to do. What do you do? Yeah, this is a great question. And, you know, back in the day of chemo immunotherapy, we really mandated uh, prophylaxis, uh, PGP and, and zoster prophylaxis uniformly uh, because of the toxicities of, you know, the purine analogs and the monoclonal antibodies. You know, now with the um, advent of the BTK inhibitors, uh, you know, and targeted therapies, uh, we have not, we saw a decrease, although not nothing, but we did see a decrease in those types of infections. So I usually take sort of a history that it, it will help guide me and I'm pretty conservative. So, um, um, you know, if somebody has a history of shingles, I really do kind of, you know, recommend that they should be on, I, I really offer those people more uh, zoster prophylaxis, even if they get vaccinated, because we know that CLL patients, their vaccination status, um, the, you know, their immune immunity to vaccines is poorer than those without. So I still, you know, would try to encourage those guys to be on uh, prophylaxis. Um, it, you know, I even, I offer, you know, in the early days of a brutinib, now remember, that was in the relapse. So this is, there's a difference between frontline and relapse as well. So in the relapse setting, there were cases of pneumocystis and there were cases of HCV, you know, so there was uh, more infectious complications, rightfully so in the relapse population, because these patients have had multiple therapies over the course of their lifetime. So that's an area that you might want to recommend more continuously, you know, prophylaxis. I'm still, cons I, I do offer and talk about the pros and cons, but I don't mandate in the frontline setting if they're starting a BTK. I think Venobi is a fair option if you're giving an antibody that you might want to do prophylaxis. I have no problems doing it in that setting. My colleagues differ. Most of my colleagues probably do not offer a lot of prophylaxis in the frontline setting with targeted therapies. I tend to be a little old school and tend to do that uh, a little bit more willingly, um, both in the frontline, but certainly in the relapse setting. So uh, Dr. Warren Brenner has a younger patient, 62 years old, uh, who initially got treated 2010 with FCR, relapsed 2015, now had T53 mutant disease, notch one, gets ibrutinib, now has disease progression. Here are his questions. She's had a few infection issues, COVID twice. She's had some sinusitis issues. So she's also been getting IVIG therapy on a regular basis, which has certainly helped. So my question in a patient like this is, in a patient with high-risk genetics, do you ever combine BCL2 and BTK inhibitor therapy? And what is the role of venetoclax versus pertubrutinib versus referral for a CAR-T in a patient such as this who's starting to slowly progress, has high-risk genetics, and has good functional status, younger age, where any of those options I think would be considered reasonable options? 
And also, what is the role of next generation sequencing in chronic lymphocytic leukemia? And does it ever impact on management decisions? Any thoughts? That's a lot. Um, so, you know, there's no doubt this person is still young. Uh, and so the fact that they had chemoimmunotherapy and a brutinib, and now they have a notch and a TP53, you know that they're not going to, um, uh, that eventually this person's going to need more than one alternative therapy option, uh, you know, in general, because they had a BTK. And so, you know, you can, there's lots of different options. One is, is I tend to, yes, can you, I guess in the short term, uh, normally, I would do a Venn-based combination for this person uh, because they got a brute nib and now have a, a TP53 and a notch. I'm going to tell you that, you know, don't get mad. I even would would favor even continuing Venn as a chronic continuous therapy because of their TP53. However, it is still not going to be indefinite therapy. Can you add Venn to your brute nib or can you combine or oral in this patient? You can. You can do that as well. Ultimately, can you? this patient will probably also likely need Perto. Yes. Um, there's data, obviously, for that because eventually the patient's going to fail venetoclax as well or or a venetoclax-based combination, whether it's with a BTK or an anti-CD20. And the patient is young enough that I do think that, so given that this will be her third line of therapy, so let's say you do some Venn-based combination, I would have her evaluated for CAR-T. So I don't think that um, even if you're not doing it at the moment, because she might still buy time, she still has Venn and she still has Perto. Um, you know, she will need it because she's young. And so I think eventually that might be a, rel a, a you know, a real option for this person. And so I do think that uh, they should be evaluated, not wait till the last minute, but be plugged in so people are aware. So I want to see if our video people can keep up with me because I was just thinking maybe I ought to show you this other uh, a comment or a series of questions that he brought up about pertubrutinib and Richter's transformation. And maybe we can just talk a little bit about pertubrutinib in general. But he also brings up some other issues. Uh, so here's Dr. Brenner again with a bunch of other questions. He had also not only about pertubrutinib and toxicity, but CAR-T and also the management of Richter's transformation. We know that pertubrutinib has recently been approved in patients who have failed a prior BTK inhibitor therapy as well as a BCL2 inhibitor therapy. My question for the clinical investigators is, is this the only setting where they consider pertubrutinib? What about the patient who has received a BTK inhibitor, but for whatever reason refuses to receive a BCL2 inhibitor such as venetoclax? Would you ever consider using pertubrutinib? And are there any unique toxicities that we need to be aware of with this agent? And also, do clinicians and clinical investigators ever do mutation testing in the BTK receptor to help make management decisions? We know that there is a CAR-T therapy agent approved in CLL for patients who have failed a prior BTK inhibitor and BCL2 inhibitor. Where would they use CAR-T therapy and would they use it after pertubrutinib or before pertubrutinib? Anything you want to hear the faculty discuss about transform CLL? Are there certain patients who are enriched to develop Richter's transformation, particularly genetic data, particularly NGS, such as patients with notch one mutations? And in patients who do develop Richter's transformation, what is the best agent to manage them? Should we treat them with anthracycline-based chemotherapy and then transition to a transplant? What is the role of CAR-T as a consolidation therapy after we potentially cited reduce them with chemotherapy? Wow. I didn't tell you that when, whenever we uh, have Dr. Brenner on, it's like a cognitive test for the faculty of their memory. <laughs> Let's see how many of those questions you can remember. <laughs> Um, so, okay, let's see. So first of all, let's talk about Perto first. Um, there's no doubt that the trial that led to its approval, um, which was the Bruin study, um, the, all the patients had prior BTK, covalent BTK inhibitor, but not all of them progressed. So some of them, so his question about can you, if they were intolerant, um, can they get um, a, a Perto after an intolerance rather than a true progression? And the answer is yes. And, and those patients were also part of the study. So all of them had prior BTK, but not all of them. Uh, most of them were due to progressive disease, but there was a small, I think it was about 20 or 25 percent that um, were just for intolerance reasons. And so, yes. And the overall response is very similar to, to both of them. Um, so they can absolutely get it. 
there's no doubt. What we don't know, uh, which is a more uh, the next level that I think he was thinking about as well, is what is the proper sequencing? So we don't have enough data. Should you go from covalent to VEN to non-covalent, which is the majority of the patients on this study, or can you go from covalent to non-covalent then to VEN? And so I think we just don't have enough data yet on going from covalent to non-covalent and then to VEN in terms of PFS or time to next treatment. Um, and you'll slowly see there are already studies that are moving PERTO more frontline and earlier line. So just stay tuned to talk about mucking up the waters even more. Stay tuned for that. But we don't know. But can you? Absolutely, you can. Now let's go to the Richters. Um, there is no doubt, and I, I think that Neil was flashing some of the survey stuff, and I, I probably answered thinking differently than my colleagues. I think that there's a couple of things when you think about Richter's. One is, is it frontline? So in a patient who's never had treated for CLL and develops Richter's, do I think following along the lines of a traditional DLBCL, RCHOP, REPOC, plus or minus venetoclax, given the data that we have then with RCHOP in, in CLL and Richter's, I think is fine because those patients are potentially curative. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually their CLL will come back, but most of those guys are curative. Most of our Richters, though, are patients who have previously had treatment. So 90% really are patients with a pr prior therapy for their CLL who develop Richters. And your question about who are those that are more at risk, um, it is that definitely the patients who are TP53, deletion 17P, notch mutated patients. Um, those are definitely um, higher risk. Uh, for developing Richter's um, uh, prognostically. Uh, but yes, those patients, I say that we don't have a good regimen for, and we're always looking at what, you know, you know, it's a definitely an unmet need. And so we're always thinking clinical trials, clinical trials. Um, there is data from the Bruin study uh, that dealt with Richter's with PERTO. Um, it, obviously, it's much less toxic than doing something like RCHOP or REPOC. I think that depending, ultimately, in a multiply relapsed Richter's patient, the RCHOP, REPOC, or any therapy is usually not good enough alone. So oftentimes, we're using that therapy to bridge them to something for curative intent. Um, so it is rare that I could give our top or our epoch in a multiply ra relapsed CLL patient with Richter's that is going to cure them. That's not going to happen. So then I'm thinking about bridging them. So you could do that, but if you think it's going to beat them up, I think Perto is a fair drug to use, uh, given that data that we have from the Richter's trial. Um, I think it's fair. It's a fair drug to to use as a bridge to either CAR T or an alloy. And again, part of that might depend on you know, how fit the patient is, uh, their availability, you know, even of an aloe. A CAR-T is obviously a little bit more reasonable in that sense uh, because they could be um, a little bit more beaten up and still go to CAR-T versus, let's say, an aloe. Um, so I think that you have to have that conversation with your BMT immuno folks who could do CAR-T therapy. But I think that you, uh, the one of the limitations we have with chemo immunotherapy in our multiply relapsed CLL patients is that it beats them up even more and they get more infections and whatnot. And then you know, you have to hold the therapy and then, you know, the disease comes back and so on and so forth. So it's a little tricky in CLL who ha develop Richter's in that sense. So I, I think PERTO is a nice bridge, uh, but certainly I think a clinical trial is the better option for any of these patients. By specifics, there are trials with by specific monoclonal antibodies and Richter's with combinations. I think those will be really good also for Richter's. Our Richter's of today is not quite the same as our Richter's in the era of chemoimmunotherapy. They're a little less sick. Um, and so there's no doubt that I think the survival has gotten a little better. And as um, that doctor noted, you know, now we have CAR T cell that's been approved for CLL, the lysocell got approved in March of 2024. And so that's a, certainly, an e it's easier now to get our patients to CAR T than it was before when you had to get them on a trial. So, um, so uh, Richter's is challenging um, and you have to, you have to take into consideration how beaten up your patient is when you're choosing which regimen you want to give them. And you were Hopefully telling me about a that. patient yeah, you you were telling me about a patient you have in their 80s. I, I would say that's more along the old line, but uh, maybe not even there, who's been on it for three years with transformed I do, disease, from the Bruin Virgo. study. 
Yeah, she's she was uh, one of the folks on the Bruin study for, that had Richter's, and she's in her 80s. I couldn't take her to a car or an aloe. She's frail, um, but she's still alive on Perto, which is great. Um, and then hopefully, you know, maybe another drug will come along that's not so toxic that if she relapses, we could give her something else. Um, so those are the kind of patients, you know, not everybody could go to CAR T or an aloe. So you have to think about how to handle them. Uh, usually chemo immunotherapy isn't enough for our Richter's patients. It's always challenging to compare indirectly between trials for things, but I'm just kind of curious in, in terms of how this lady did. And uh, you're not too, most docs in practice haven't used that much PERDO, but uh, from your point of view, do you think it's less toxic than the sec oh, second yeah. generation agent? Yeah, asked about that. I forgot. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's a really, I mean, obviously, um, you know, PERDO hasn't been around as long as the other drugs. Um, so we have less uh, follow up, although now we have pretty good follow up. I'd say about four years of data on PERDO. Um, and so that it, it really is a very easy drug to use. The bleeding and the bruising, I think, are pretty fairly consistent with all the BTKs, but there's very little in the way of hyper tension or cardiac toxicities. Um, it's very, it's, a, it's once a day dosing. So it's also really, um, uh, it's an easy drug. It's very clean. Um, you know, again, we'll see if there are any mounting toxicities. We had presented that data and follow up last year um, at ASCO and there was no new toxicities. It's still very low cardiac adverse events and very low of the other toxicities with the exception of, I think the bruising and bleeding is a, very similar, but I think it's a very clean BTK inhibitor. And as I said, you're going to see the non-covalence move up earlier in lines of therapy. So stay tuned. In fact, my colleague, Nitin Jane, presented a frontline, you know, triplet therapy with pertubrutinib Ben and OB in treatment naive patients. And the data looks outstanding. Um, so we'll have to see, they're going to obviously increase the enrollment of that trial to see um, from this pilot to see, you know, how it compares to other doublets and triplets in the frontline setting. But, but yes, it's pretty clean. And I think he asked about NGS testing. Yeah. Right. We could talk about yep. that in general. Uh, and that just has to do with, you know, in general, you know, for time limited approaches, oh, when he asked about BTK mutations, um, you know, for time limited approaches, you know, I think, you know, we're trying to figure out how to use MRD testing, of course. Um, you know, the different sensitivities of NGS testing haven't been standardized. Obviously, you have flow cytometry, you have NGS, you know, so 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5th, 10 to the minus 6. Obviously, the deeper levels of sensitivity that you can attain you know, if they're truly MRD negative, that does translate into a longer time off of therapy. And so for somebody who's on a time limited approach, this is where that testing might be important, or we're trying to figure out how to use this. Obviously, if somebody's on chronic therapy, there's no point in testing. You don't need to do that. Uh, but for time limited approaches, there are three, I, I like to point out that there have been several trials that have changed how long time limited is. You have, you know, 12 months, in some studies, then you have 15 months, 15 months, 15, 16 months in other studies. And then you even have, if you think about the UK FLARE trial, which looked at a brutinib and Ven that was based on MRD guidance uh, from peripheral blood and bone marrow, the, the amount of time patients were on therapy was dictated by when they achieved their first negative M MRD. And so they could be on a minimum of two years, but they could be on therapy as max as six years. And so uh, what they notice is the longer, of course, that people were on therapy, the deeper, the longer, you know, the better their responses were. But then the question is, is how how much is time limited then? So if you're going to be on for a long period of time, does that defeat the purpose? So I think we don't have an answer yet. And what we're trying to figure out is there's some patients that if they're MRD positive, um, if you continue drug, some will become MRD negative. But if you continue drug, some of them won't. And then those are the patients you should be like, you wanted a time limit approach, you're not going to become MRD negative, stop your therapy. Um, similarly, if we could figure out the patients who might, if we hang on and they stay on a little longer and they become MRD negative, ultimately that may impact their subsequent response duration and time to their next treatment. Those are the good ones you might extend. And so that's what we're trying to learn and figure out so we can help everybody kind of use MRD in a fashion that makes sense um, and is translatable into clinical practice. And then you'll say, yes, this based on these features, I think this patient, we can give them a little bit longer therapy or no, this person based on their, you know, they're not going to get any, you know, if we extend therapy, they're still going to have some MRD, give them a break. They wanted a time limited approach. So I think we're still learning how to use uh, MRD testing in clinical practice. 
So speaking of MRD, we have a case related to that. But first, uh, just to take a look at a couple of slides, I was just looking at the, I love this. What's one of my favorite waterfall plots in all of oncology? But I didn't notice, you just pointed out that that light blue are people with toxic effects or other reasons. That's interesting. And then um, uh, I'm not, we're not going to go into these. Just check out the uh, slide set if you want to get into it. We were talking about uh, uh, toxicity with pertubertinib. You've written a lot about it. You were just talking about bleeding risk. Here's a paper that looks at that uh, and getting into that. And we asked the faculty where they're using pertubertinib, typically right now in the third line setting and patients with uh, CLL. And uh, you address the issue of what we know indirectly comparing efficacy and tolerability. Uh, so we're going to get into another uh, case, but first one, just one other thing of, uh, related to, we were just talking about uh, transformed disease, and here's uh, the paper from the, this year's Lancet uh, looking at, uh, pay, again, pretty good uh, waterfall plot for Richter's transformation. Anything else you want to say about that? Yeah, again, so you could see these really nice responses. Um, and as I said, it's just much less toxic than um, our CHOP or our EPOC. It doesn't mean that this is going to be by no means indefinite therapy for these individuals. I think the lady I have is probably an exception. Um, but I think that, you know, um, you know, most of these, uh, you're going to need to probably bridge them to alternative therapy, but it's much more tolerable than an anthracycline based um, chemo immunotherapy regimen. So a 46-year-old patient, don't see that too much, has got CLL as a patient of Dr. Maz, who got BR, and then second-line venetoclax rituximab. And she actually got an MRD assay and decided to continue therapy. And that's what her question is. She, we know we've done, uh, we, do, we do these surveys with docs, and most of them stick with the trial. But occasionally you find even investigators who will keep venetoclax going for MRD positivity. So she, she did it, and here are her questions. My question is really MRD testing for CLR patients. What setting, how does it guide treatment I'm still struggling with? So venetoclax, if we use in first-line setting, you know, after finish one-year treatment, do anyone advise to routinely incorporate MRD testing to help guide should we stop or should we do longer? If we decide to do longer because patient's MRD positive, how frequent you test it? You try again in a year? How does that routine practice pattern should be in this case? What about second line? I have several patients, they used BTK inhibitor and then they go to venetoclax second line. What will you do in that case? How is MRD going to be incorporated? Any other questions? Yeah, I am curious, you know, anybody will borrow the first line data use obinutuzumab in the second line setting and replace rituximab because it definitely has more cell kill in that situation. But I don't know the insurance approval situation. And if, you know, we are allowed to use second line setting, what about the timing? You know, you do it concurrently or you do it sequentially like the first line. But I haven't done it personally because I just assume it wouldn't be approved. So I haven't tried yet. You feel like you're on rounds with the fellows and they're just all throwing you <laughs> one thing here. <laughs> all right. Uh, another another memory question. test. <laughs> Go ahead. It's a great question. I mean, there's no doubt. So first of all, um, it, her question is great and we all struggle with this, right? So we're not, I think for most of us, if so, a patient is really choosing a time-limited approach, we want to get them off therapy because that's what they chose. But um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things, um, you know, if they're MRD positive and let's say you tell the patient, the patient's like, well, doc, if I, if I took the drug a little longer, maybe I become MRD negative, you know, can we do that? Have I done that? I have, um, you know, I usually will text test repeat testing somewhere, you know, three to six months. If somebody is really still persistently positive, I'm probably going to talk to them about trying to come off to give them a break because that's really what they wanted. Now, again, you might question if they're high risk, you know, do you want to, do you want to stop it at all? That's a different question. If they're TP53, we can go into that whole diatribe. But, um, you know, then I probably would have put them on a BTK unless there was a reason I couldn't. Uh, but, you know, otherwise, we, we're we trying to figure out, you know, what to do. For most part, we're telling folks that they should probably discontinue therapy until we have more data and can concretely tell. If you, they, they actually, um, if you look at this from retreatment studies, um, so there, there are a couple of studies that are looking at 
you know, the what we hope is that most people, if they get Venobi, that they're going to buy at least two years off of therapy, if not more. Um, if somebody falls short of that, we're not going to want to retreat them with the same combination. And in fact, right, Matt Davids has his trial, the revenge trial, looking at re-challenging patients uh, if they got Venobi in frontline and then relapse, um, you know, repeating Venobi. But depending upon the timing of when they relapsed, consider consider continue it longer versus shorter and patients are randomized again, depending upon how much time they bought off of VenOB in, in the frontline setting. And so stay tuned. So we'll learn a little bit about that in, in a prospective fashion rather than retrospective. Um, you know, so I think that most of us, uh, what she also asked about, can you use obinutuzumab in the relapse setting versus the frontline setting? And the answer of course is yes. And I don't think, I mean, you know, I, I am, um, I'm not in private practice, but I don't have pushback in the, in an academic institution about that. Now that might be different in private practice. I think you just but I, from what I hear from many of my colleagues that, that, that is, you know, they just get prior, you know, you obviously would prior auth for that, but most patients, you can use Obina in relapse. Um, so you just have to see if that's okay. It may be particularly, you know, maybe there might be some issues depending upon somebody's particular insurance, but most of us do feel that Obina is obviously a little bit more potent uh, of a monoclonal antibody than rituximab is. Uh, and so I think that, yes, I think the notion is you can probably use it in frontline or relapse if you want to to do that. Um, one could also argue, however, um, that, uh, let me quote Susan O'Brien, uh, is that if you use more rituximab, uh, so if, you know, there was an old study, you know, before Obina became into favor when she did, uh, you know, using escalated doses of rituximab or even more doses of rituximab that was done in a cooperative group study with fludarabine, you'll eventually catch up if you're using a lot more antibody over time. And so um, you could also use more retux if you really wanted to. That's just throwing a monkey wrench based on historical data. But ultimately, yes, you could use obinutuzumab. Um, um, in the relapse setting, uh, if, if you want to do that. Um, again, you, we don't have a good answer for MRD testing for you yet. I do think some patients would benefit from a longer course, but not all. And some will stay persistently positive. And then are you going to commit them to staying on VEN indefinitely? And so that probably wasn't what they wanted to sign up for in the first place. Otherwise, they would have chosen chronic continuous therapy. So I think it's okay to extend for a bit. I don't have the right answer about how long, three months, six months, nine months to a year. But if somebody's persistently positive, they're probably not going to become negative if it's a year and they're still positive. So then you have to make a decision. Are you just going to continue them indefinitely on venetoclax or should you just really just give them a break off therapy? And that's what I would probably do. All right, let's close with a 30 second uh, case from the chat room from Rosanna has a patient in the mid seventies with CL, but a history of diffuse large B cell has an ejection fraction of 20%. I don't know if that's from the prior anthracyclines. But now I'm just going to make it more brief. It may have an indication to treat. Uh, what do you think about BTK and somebody with an ejection fraction of e of twenty percent? Or generally, how do you think that through? E. So they have they have DLBCL now, or they had DL? DLBCL? No, they had, had it before. Had it before. And now just have CLL. Right. Oh, okay. I guess cured. I just wanna... Cured. A diff Cured of uh, diffuse okay. B cell, I would assume. So yeah. the only question about that is, if they go into AFib with a BTK inhibitor, um, will they? You know, how much reserve do they have? And so, right, so you might put them into heart failure. Um, and so that would be my concern about somebody who's got a poor ejection fraction doing a BTK inhibitor. I would prefer probably doing Ven on that patient. Um, for that reason, just because I'd be a little nervous, but I would also talk to the cardiologist, like how brittle, you know, there are some patients who aren't really that brittle despite their EF being low. So I would want to know from the cardiologist, how brittle are they? Because I probably, I might want to avoid the class in general, even though second generations are much better and have much less AFib, it's still a risk. And so um, I might choose a VEN-based approach unless, let's say the patient got VEN and then they relapse and you still needed the drug. Then of course, I think you'd be like, okay, I'm going to do this, but we're going to have to, you know, you have to be upfront about the fact that if they go into AFib, that there's a potential they can go into heart failure because they, their EF is so poor. So feel better. Would you feel better with Perdo, Perdo if you could? Um, you know, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, maybe, although I don't really have a comparative analysis. As I said, the data looks really clean for Perto. I'm not going to lie, but it's not like, you know, it also looks really good for Xano and Acala with the AFib. I mean, it's really low, you know, we're talking less than 5%. So, um, uh, so I'd feel better for sure with a second generation or with Perto, if you were going to do a, a BTK at all in this patient. Um, but I would definitely loop in cardiology about that. And you have to be upfront with the patient about that. 
So, Nicole, I'm not going to lie by saying this is the fastest hour I've had in the last few months. My brain is like, whoa. <laughs> but hey, that's a good thing, particularly for CLL nowadays. We really needed it. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole. Thanks to the audience for attending. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Nicole. Thank you.